Hi, so I guess some of you at least heard about a bit about OpenSNP yesterday during the panel already, what we are doing, but let me give you a brief introduction again. So OpenSNP is based on this graph, which we all have seen too many times already. So yes, sequencing is getting cheaper, and this also means that sequencing or at least genetic testing for end users gets cheaper and cheaper. So nowadays you can just go to Amazon, buy yourself a genetic test for like less than $100. And if you want to learn about how genetics actually works, the textbook will set you off more than the actual genetic <laughs> test. So this leads to like the same graph which we've seen before, just the other way around. So more and more people are getting genetic testing nowadays. So 23andMe like got there one million user a couple of uh, months back already. And the same is true for ancestry DNA. So more and more people get access to their personal genetics data. But if we now want to see whether it's also true for open data, that's unfortunately not the case. If you look at how much of those data sets are somehow publicly available, more and more people are getting sequenced or genotyped, but none of the data is publicly available. And we've heard in this keynote this morning about that it's for one reason, it's because it's not that easy to share this data, but if it, you, if it comes to like direct to consumer genetic testing, it should be pretty easy because it's my genetic data and if I want to share it, I can just do it. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because where would you like to share it? And there's like the Personal Genome Project and a couple of other projects, but they're all tied to research institutions. So they all have like some IRB requirements and it's not that easy to share them if you're not from the same country. So I can't as a German go to the Personal Genome Project in Harvard and share my data. So we decided to like do our own completely independent open data project called OpenSNP. And as we don't have any institutional limitations, we went for a very simple approach of sharing genetic data. So you don't have to read all of our terms of service, even though these are the complete ones, so it's pretty simple. And I like to say it's human readable and not lawyer readable. So hopefully you can understand the risks involved in it. So we basically tell you, you will lose your job and also you will lose all your insurance. And the same is true for your family because your genetic data is out there and they share your genome. Do you still want to share your genome? If yes, go along with it. If you'd rather not do it, please don't. So we basically want to try to scare people away from sharing data. And this is working quite nice since we started the project in 2011. So by now we have like over 2,700 data sets on the platform, which is largely 23andMe, a couple of ancestry DNA, and I think there might even be one or two decode me data sets in there. The older of us might remember this Icelandic company. And Yes, so it's now over 4,500 registered users, and we like not only share genetic data, but people are also collecting, or we are collecting different annotations about it. So there's the Snipedia, which is also an open data project where people read publications. They collect all the information about genetic variants and make them publicly available. So we mine this. We also mine primary publications from the Public Library of Science, from Mendeley, and see whether it's open access or not on the GWAS catalog and so on. We somehow try to summarize it all and even kind of rank different genetic variations to say these might be interesting because there's lots of science already done, and these might not be so interesting because no one knows what's going on there in any case. And genetic data on itself, if you wanted to research on it, is not that interesting. So we also allow people to annotate their own bodies, basically using phenotypes. And people just give us this data right away, and it's all crowdsourced as well. So if you would like to collect data about yourself and ask other people, like the 2,700 other people, what's your favorite text editor, you can do so and can start doing a genome-wide association study and figuring out whether Emacs somehow is inherited or not. So yes, we get like a couple of useful phenotypes, like, and people are willing to share some of them at least quite easily. I mean, if you ask for eye color and hair color and their height, people are willing to share it, and they might also share your text editor preference and give this away freely, even if you don't ask them for it. But for other things like cancers and allergies and maybe different things, people are not that willing to share. So some of them are only shared or given like the data by a couple of people and the largest one are shared so far by like I think nearly 800 people have given us different phenotypes. So, so far this is the data we collect and if you want to access this data you can get it pretty easily. If you go to opensnip.org there's and you are not logged in there's a button download the data on the front page. If you click it you will get like one zip archive of 15 gigabytes in size containing all the genetic variants, all the phenotypes, everything that's in our database basically you will get it. So don't use the conference Wi-Fi here for it. Then there's also like the JSON API if you want to access like specific points of information and good people at R OpenSci already have a wrapper for it. So if you want to do your stats in R and analyze it in R, you can do it right away. 
And if you have like some visualization that yeah, requires the distributed notation system, we also support this. So if you want to get data out of OpenSNP, it should be pretty easy. And the data is completely freely licensed. So basically everyone who enters data does so doing the public domain declaration Creative Commons Zero. So it's really completely free. Whatever you want to use the data for, you can do it basically. And if you want to look at what people are using the data so far for, one case I always like to show is like that people are just analyzing each individual data set and going back to users. So I got this email from one of our users saying, I download your data set and your data set, first of all, shows me you're European, no surprise there somehow. Also, you carry this weird SNP for some kind of heart condition, but now we don't know too far about, too much about it so far, so don't worry about it right now. And basically the last thing says, well, your parents are not somehow closely related, good news. So this might happen to you, and this is another thing that people have to keep in mind if they share data. So if you don't want to know this, and people just email you this basically, you might be in for a surprise that you didn't want to know. So beware of sharing data in this case. Then people are also using our data for analyzing ancestry in a larger context. So if you have like those pinkish dots here are in relation to the HapMap populations, if you just plot them as a PCA, and the same person that sent me this email also looked into like the haplotypes for whether people are related to Richard III and actually like three or four people in our database have the same haplotype at least. So they might have like some good claim on the British throne now that they are not European any longer. And another interesting thing is that people also use our data for using it into genetic privacy. So one really interesting paper that I think was last year is this de-anonymizing genomic databases using the phenotypic traits. So what they basically did is they just used the phenotypes, which you can observe, like eye color and hair color, to pick the correct genetic data set from our database. And then you can go back and say, this is now the genetic data set, I know it belongs to this person, and now I can infer all the other phenotypes that I can't observe directly. So just by knowing basically your hair color and eye color, they want to predict your Alzheimer's status, for example which works fine on very small data sets. The more data we get, the harder it gets. So if you share your data freely enough, it becomes a harder problem. And also what I really like is that people who have no clue about genetics start just using the data to educate themselves. So this is a blog post which was posted, I think also last year at some point, and people just use our data to educate themselves and say, I have no clue about genetics, and I have, don't have $200 after spending already $100 in genetic testing to get a textbook. So let's just somehow analyze it on our own. The problem is that we've discussed like the curse of success briefly last uh, yesterday in the panel. And for us, it's just the amount of data we get. So like each genotyping data set contains between 500,000 and a million SNPs. So this rapidly piles up on how much data you have to analyze. And as a side effect, more or less, this is how the open SNP servers were behaving lately, let's say not the fastest any longer. And the problem here is basically that we used to be structured like this. All the OpenSNP infrastructure was based on this one huge monolithic server infrastructure, and one machine, which hosted the web server, the database, like all the background jobs and so on. And because of this, all different parts of the project had to compete for resources and in the end, nothing worked any longer. And our problem is, as I said, we're not associated with any university or research institution, so we have no access to traditional funding. We can beg for money like at regular grant uh, organizations, but they won't give us any, especially given the fact that we, at least when we started, I think now like for half a year, we have the first PhD on the project before it was all master students or PhD students without any advanced degrees. So in order to get some money, we had to look for alternative funding sources, and this is what, what we spent like good parts of the last year on. So we started, first of all, our Patreon campaign. So we start now crowdfunding and people basically give us monthly donations. We also joined GratiPay, which is very similar. So people just donate basically small amounts of money every week. And this already allowed us basically to get larger infrastructure because we get some money in. And additionally, Seven Bridges was so kind even to match the donations, basically. So they even offered initially to pay for all of our hosting costs. But we said, well, in principle, we like to be independent. So if Seven Bridges decides to not give us any money any longer, it's okay because we have like the complete community paying for our hosting costs already. So with this, now we are really happy because we have lots and lots of funding th to throw out of the window, basically. And we can start basically taking the hammer and break down the huge monolith. 
And with this, now we basically, what we did, instead of having one huge machine, we went for having like a couple of smaller ones. So we have like the web server independent, we have the database server independent, the background tasks and so on. But this brings like a new problem up. And this is the problem of how to deploy this. It's pretty simple and to, because when you only had one machine, you just put it on there, you start the service and you're good to go. And after being at Boss Glasky and everyone is doing Docker, we had to do Docker too. So by now our workflow is basically once we merge our things into GitHub, it automatically goes to Travis CI and if we see that hopefully it builds correctly, it goes to Docker and Docker Hub and from there it gets automatically deployed on all our different machines. So it's pretty easy, even though I have to admit I have no clue how it works. So we have like one member in our group, Helge is his name, and he's like the master of Docker for us. He did all of this, so the credit for all of this goes to him. Another big part of what we've done over the last 12 months was community work, and here Abby and the Mozilla Science Lab need to get a big cheers again. So what we done first of all was we adopted the code of conduct and we fixed up our readme and contribution so that new people coming to the project, first of all, can feel like they're in a safe place and they know where to start. So we now have like the open issues fixed up. We have still lots of open issues, but they're somehow labeled to what kind of expertise you will need and how hard it will be. We moved lots of our communication into Gitter, which means that we are now basically just chatting amongst each other all the time. And we got the goal of getting some new contributors and I think this worked also out pretty nicely. So we now basically have a small, nice community which likes to party around. And thanks to the OBF, we have to say, we also have like three new contributors in the form of GSOC students and one of them is even here. So first of all, we have Graham Dyer who's not here and he's working on integrating quantified self APIs. We already have like some support for Fitbit. So if you have Fitbit to track your steps, sleep and wait over time, and you want to add this as phenotypic data into OpenSNP, you can already do it. And he's right now working on an application for your Apple Watch. So if you use an iPhone or your Apple Watch, you can get all this data and share it into the public domain through OpenSNP as well. Then we also have Vivek Rush sitting here in the first row since a couple of minutes, luckily. And he's working on linking the phenotypes to the SNPs because so far it's not really tied into each other. So we have like all the SNP data and we have the phenotypes, but if you go to like a certain SNP and we have like annotations for the different phenotypes which might be linked already, you can't say, oh, I would like to enter my phenotype. And hopefully this at some point over the next weeks will be possible. And last but not least, we have Mateus from Brazil. And he's doing basically all of our UI in Newly because so far we used Bootstrap and started using Bootstrap five years ago and didn't bother to change anything. So yes, it's really ugly and it's not responsive. So we should change it. And luckily we found someone who said, yes, I will do it. And he actually knows what he's doing because when Philip and I started the project back then, none of us are designers. We are not even real bioinformaticians. So we did the best we could. So it's time to improve it a bit. And with that, I would like to basically already thank all of our projects. So we are this small but dedicated group. So we have Philip and Helge and Julia Rida. She also helped us when we started out. Then we have Samantha in the middle there. She's like one of our first users and did like lots of like input on like how to fix bugs and make it possible. And then we have our three students who contribute a lot. And if you're really keen on seeing all the contributors, there's like our humans TXT where you can read all of them and all the thanks. And special thanks need to go first of all to John Wilbanks who, whoops, who helped us a lot over the last couple of years, basically, and since the beginning, believed in the project, then the Mozilla Science Lab for lots and lots of support over the last year. Our fancy new logo, and there are lots of stickers around, which you can take, comes from Elio, and yeah, we have now 4,500 users who share their data and their expertise, and we have like the patrons that support us with their financial support each month. So thanks a lot, and we can take questions now.